Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's town hall. My name is Emily Kosick, and I'm the Knowledge Manager at the Canadian Institute for Public Safety Research and Treatment. Today's town hall topic is, I don't think you should be here, understanding and overcoming gender disparities in policing. Um, we are having a little bit of a technical problem with a couple of our panelists for today. So they are gonna be appearing with us um, voice only. So I am just going to go ahead and unmute them at this moment. Uh, uh, Mickey, if you wanna go ahead, uh, you can unmute yourself and we should be able to hear you. Oh, hopefully Mickey can hear me. There we go. Hi, Mickey. Oh, I saw you for a second. Okay, I apologize, everyone. Like I said, uh, technology sometimes gives us a few uh, bumps in the road. My computer so, uh, says I'm unmuted, but... Perfect. I can hear you now, Mickey. That's oh. great. <laughs> we have lift off. Good. <laughs> exactly. So uh, Mickey is going to be joining us via voice only today. So uh, thank you for that. Um, I'm just going to uh, quickly share my own screen so I'm on the right. All right. So uh, today's topics, uh, first of all, I'm going to go through a couple of quick uh, housekeeping notes here. Uh, as you can see, uh, sometimes the computer system does not allow you to join. Some organizations have blocks or sometimes it doesn't work. So GoToWebinar uh, might allow you to only join by phone or voice only, which is what has happened to one of our uh, speakers today, uh, Mickey Ruth. Uh, so uh, technology at its best. Um, all of you are generally in listen only mode. This is to uh, prevent feedback and uh, noise destruction during the uh, session. Uh, the session is being recorded and a copy of the recording will be sent out to you within 48 hours. Uh, please use the questions box uh, to send us any questions uh, for our panelists throughout the session. So uh, I am going to go ahead and introduce today's presenter, and I'm going to apologize profusely if I get it wrong. <laughs> uh, our today's presenter is Andrienne Aker. Is that correct? Hopefully. Uh, she has earned her master's from the University of Regina, and she is a PhD candidate at the Université de Québec at Trois Rivières. Hopefully, I said that okay as well. Um, our panelists for today are uh, Lucy Tremblay, who is on video with us. She is the Deputy Chief of Police uh, at Via Rail Canada Police Service. And she's the Secretary of the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police uh, and the, for the Human Resources and Learning Committee. Uh, on the phone, which you heard there for a moment, is Mickey Ruth. She's the Chair of the Edmonton Police Commission and President of the Canadian Association of uh, Police Governance. I am just going to see, uh, there's Vaughn. Uh, Vaughn has joined us. So Vaughn, if you can hear me, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, Vaughn is the Director of Gender-Based Analysis at the RCMP. And she will be joining us again just by phone, just because of some of our technical difficulties today. Vaughn, can you hear me? Yes, I can, hi. Perfect. All right, thank you so much for being with us today. And I'm sorry for the technical issues. Um, I am going to go ahead and I do have a quick poll that we're going to do with you guys. We just want to kind of get an idea of where you guys are with the topic that we're going to be discussing today, which is gender and policing. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to launch the poll and you guys are going to have about 30 seconds to go ahead and answer the question. So the question is, do you think there's been improvement? Uh, in uh, gender and policing roles or the culture of police uh, in the last five years. Okay, I'm gonna give you a couple more seconds here to respond. So it looks like we've got about 80% responding. So I'm gonna go ahead and close that poll. All right, so hopefully I will display the answers here for you. So it looks like 47% uh, of you think that yes, there has been an improvement in the policing culture when it comes to gender. 24% think no, and 29% are not sure. So uh, it's great though, for those of you who are not sure, we'll kind of uh, give you information on where we've uh, seen it with this presentation. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and hide that poll for us now. All right, so I am going to turn over the presentation to Andrianne, 
and she can go ahead and take control and display her slides for us. And uh, we'll be back shortly after the presentation uh, to join you for a discussion. Okay, so wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, Emily. Um, bonjour, hi everyone. Um, so this will be a bilingual presentation. So first of all, thank you so much for being here today uh, for this webinar. I have the opportunity to be presenting the results from my master's thesis research. Um, et j'ai la chance de vous présenter ces résultats dans une présentation qui va être entièrement bilingue. Um, so you'll see throughout the presentation, the information will be available in both French and English in written format, and I'll be uh, verbally switching from French and English. So before we start, I would like to first and foremost thank my research supervisor, Dr. Nicholas Carlton, uh, who's provided guidance and support throughout the project as well as my master's committee who's helped me um, in the creation of this project. I would like to thank our subject matter experts who are here today. So uh, Vaughn, Lucy and Mickey, uh, who've taken the time to participate in this webinar, as well as to Sipsert and Emily for coordinating all of, this, all of this. And of course, the participating police officers and services who have really taken the time to share their experience and made this project possible. So I'm very grateful. Pour vous donner un petit aperçu de la présentation aujourd'hui, je vais commencer avec une introduction du sujet. Ensuite, je vais vous parler de la méthodologie et des résultats qui étaient quantitatifs et qualitatifs. Puis on va suivre avec une conclusion et les recommandations qui sont en lien avec les résultats. So, in general, police officers will encounter on average three traumatic events every six months as part of their work. And in part due to these events, officers are more likely to be diagnosed with a mental disorder than the general public. So women specifically in the municipal police uh, were found to be 1.66 times more likely to screen positive for a mental disorder than men. And while researchers have indicated that there are factors that can contribute to that, such as coping strategies, work-life balance and stress factors, there are really few empirical studies which examine these differences while using a gender balanced sample. So meaning the same amount of men and women used in the research. Police culture is characterized by hegemonic masculinity. And I'll use that throughout the presentation and to give you an, an idea of what hegemonic masculinity is, it's this hierarchy, hierarchy that's based on an idealized version of manhood and that it impacts the expectation that is placed on both men and women and that results in restrictive and oppressive gender norms. So my master's research specifically examined the impact of gender on the mental health of municipal police, which allowed for a nuanced examination of how the experiences of both men and women impacted their mental health. And throughout the presentation, I'll be uh, referring exclusively to a policing population. So I'll use the terms men and women, but I'll mean men and women who are police officers. La méthodologie de ma recherche était une combinaison de données quantitatives et de qualitatives, donc des questionnaires et des entrevues. Il y avait en fait trois étapes. Donc, premièrement, il y a eu les données qui, ont, qui sont sorties d'un sondage pan-canadien qui ont examiné les différences entre les hommes et les femmes policiers en ce qui est de leurs euh, symptômes de troubles de santé mentale. Donc, total des participants pour cette partie de l'étude étaient 1377 agents de police municipaux ou régionaux à travers le Canada et 36 de ces participants étaient des femmes. Ensuite, quatre policiers, deux hommes et deux femmes, avec un nombre de services, euh, d'années de service et d'expériences occupationnelles différentes, ont été recrutés pour agir comme des informants clés et participer à des entrevues qui étaient non structurées, qui ont informé la création d'un guide d'entrevue semi-structuré. Finalement, il y a eu 17 policiers, dont neuf femmes, qui m'ont indépendamment contacté après avoir reçu le recrutement et qui ont participé à des entrevues semi-structurées. Ces entrevues semi-structurées-là étaient euh, avec le guide que j'avais créé à la, avec les, les informants clés. So the first part uh, included an online questionnaire which measured uh, symptoms of mental health um, difficulties. So we measured post-traumatic stress disorders, major depression disorder, general anxiety disorder, and alcohol use disorder. And we wanted to also look at um, covariates, so things that have been associated with um, a risk of mental disorders in policing. So we looked at organizational and operational stress, as well as social support and organizational support. 
the qualitative phase was intended to evaluate how participants' narratives, so how they would uh, respond in the interviews, could help contextualize the quantitative results that we got from the questionnaire, as well as to better understand what was unique and what was shared in the experience of each participant, but also of men and women. We created themes to create, uh, to represent and organize what emerged during the interviews. So what did we find in terms of results? Um, so here I'm going to refer to screening rates and to give you an, an idea of what screening rates are, I want to mention that none of these are clinical diagnoses, but rather symptoms that are at the level of clinical significance through self-report questionnaires. So in terms of um, the online questionnaires, we found that women had higher screening rates, so higher rates of symptoms for PTSD, depression, and anxiety. Men, on the other hand, had higher uh, rates for alcohol use disorder than women did. Now what's interesting is that when we took into account in our statistics um, social support, organizational support, and occupational and organizational stress, um, there were no more differences on depression between men and women. Il n'y avait pas de différence quand on a regardé euh, le stress policier, donc que ce soit le stress opérationnel ou organisationnel, c'était la même chose pour les hommes et les femmes. Ensuite, quand on a regardé les sources de support social, on a trouvé des différences intéressantes. Donc, les femmes ont rapporté recevoir plus de support social de leur relation, donc euh, ils se sentaient plus soutenus de leur relation en dehors de la police, et les hommes, au contraire, ont indiqué qu'ils recevaient plus de support de leur organisation et de leurs collègues que les femmes. Il y avait quatre thèmes globaux qui étaient en lien avec la santé mentale et le genre chez les policiers. Donc là, je vais vous parler des résultats qui étaient plus qualitatifs, donc des entrevues. Chaque thème comprenait un nombre de sous-thèmes, mais pour les fins de la présentation, je vais discuter uniquement des thèmes globaux et je vais présenter des citations pour chaque. J'aimerais indiquer que les citations originales ont été traduites par moi-même, donc je vais lire les euh, versions originales anglaises, mais les traductions françaises sont incluses aussi. So as I mentioned, as I want to mention, I translated the quotes myself, but in order to really present participants' narratives, I will be reading all the quotes in their original English versions, but trans, uh, French translations are included for all of them. So police culture included, included three organizing themes, which were high school culture, romantic relationships, and an us versus them mentality. Une participante a décrit la culture policière comme le plus grand défi pour elle à travers sa carrière. So a woman nine said, most challenging would be the internal drama. That's the biggest or hardest time is the way that people talk or about, talk to or about other people that we work with. It's just a really negative environment that way. I would say that's the biggest challenge. The impact of police, police culture appeared to be different in relation to hegemonic masculinity. So again, that's the idealized version of manhood. And for this, woman three said, police culture might be even tougher on if you're not a stereotypical male, if you're a softer, gentler, smaller male, I think you might be more, I know I've seen it, impacted more harsh than the alpha male. The non-alpha males are picked on bad. Le thème d'expérience genrée comprenait plusieurs sous-thèmes, donc la discrimination, le harcèlement sexuel, la balance entre le travail et la vie personnelle, les hommes et les femmes comme étant différents, la masculinité hégémonique et l'intersectionnalité. So all women participants uh, in the project had either directly experienced or knew of a woman officer who had experienced some form of sexual harassment. In the, in the sample, no men reported uh, having experienced or witnessed internal discrimination or harassment. Women also mentioned receiving advice, specifically men for women, about the different experiences that a woman will have as a police officer and the labels that women often received. So women too mentioned that this really created a community and a bond within the women. She said, I think all of our women are a community within themselves because there's often discussions in the locker room about like, I can't believe that just happened or I can't believe that person said that to me. 
and they'll say, that happened to me too. We still have some of those really dominant, bullheaded, stereotypical male who is like that and treats all females the same. Plusieurs participants ont, mas ont mentionné leur surprise lorsqu'elles ont réalisé que certains comportements étaient perpétués par leurs collègues, même en travaillant dans un milieu policier. C'était l'expérience de la femme numéro 6 qui a dit « But then it was like, okay, just ignore them, ignore them, ignore them, ignore, ignore them. » And then it's like text messaging, comments, and it's, I don't know, covert. And then it would get to like some inappropriate comments And it was for me shocking and inappropriate. And again, we police, but yet we allow that behavior. One participant also mentioned receiving a very conflictual welcome when she joined a new unit as a woman. So woman nine shares, my boss's boss is at the unit of the time, kind of welcomed me to the unit, but it was a really hypocritical, like welcome to the unit, but I don't think you should be here. And I want you to get as much opportunity as possible, but take all the vacation that you want. Like, if you need to go and want to go on vacation, go ahead. La perception d'identité était aussi une chose qui variait entre les hommes et les femmes. Et on a vu, par exemple, de la femme numéro 5 qui a expliqué ça en mettant en contexte elle et son conjoint qui était aussi un policier. So, woman 5 said, Where my husband's more like defined in a way by being a police officer, like that's his life. And there's a lot of guys who are like that too. Whereas I'm like, you know, yeah, this is what I do for a living, like as a job, but I had a whole life before I started this job. I went to university, I have a degree, I have friends. Men also experienced, um, expressed seeing differences between themselves and women in terms of work-life balance, but particularly when that was related to motherhood and having a family. And that was the case with man three who shared his experience um, and his spouse also worked in policing. He said, so she basically put off her career to get mentioning their child old enough that he could kind of look after himself sometimes. So I think that she made that sacrifice for sure. And I think that would be pretty common for a lot of women in policing. Les inquiétudes qui étaient en lien avec le travail comprenaient les changements et aussi les défis qui étaient liés à une carrière dans la police. Participants described a low tolerance for mental health, both in regards to officers themselves and the community that they, serves, they served. However, participants reporting that there was a shift for more compassion in policing. And Man Tu um, illustrated how he really, throughout his career, was able to see that shift. So he said, when I started in the late 90s, the mentality was, we're tough, we can take anything. If you can't handle this, you've made a bad career choice. There was no empathy, no dealing with, how do we deal with the stuff that we're exposed to? It was, you just do it. You go out for drinks and that's what you do. Now it's not quite there yet, but it's getting a lot better in terms of, it's okay for things to affect you. Il y avait deux thèmes qui étaient en lien avec la santé mentale, soit la stigmatisation ou les stratégies d'adaptation. So mental health stigma appeared difficult to change at the cultural level, despite changes that we saw at the organizational level and in policy, such as what Mentu mentioned earlier. Participants describe a policing culture that was really reluctant and that hated change, and where mental health conversations were often only superficial. Participants reported derogatory perceptions of officers who no longer wanted to work on patrol or who needed to prioritize their well-being by changing their shifts. Some officers believed that policy shifts had actually increased the cultural stigma. And this is what Man 8 illustrate when he says, so there's a big push for everyone to talk about it and end the stigma. I can tell you that it's still there and it's strong and it gets stronger. I think services in general have a long way to go. And there's what they publicly say about mental health, and then there's what actually goes on. If somebody takes time off, they're shunned quite a bit. If they mention something, they are shunned quite a bit. And that's, I think that's getting worse. L'expression des émotions était considérée comme une caractéristique féminine. Donc, tout probablement, encore une fois, en lien avec la, la masculinité hégémonique, 
les participants ont rapporté que les difficultés que les femmes vivaient étaient mises en contexte avec leur féminité et le fait justement qu'elles étaient des femmes. Donc, c'était pris moins au sérieux que quand un homme rapportait les mêmes difficultés. Les hommes aussi, qui avaient un moins grand statut social, étaient plus susceptibles d'être mis de côté. So we saw that there was a gender stigma that not only affected women, but that also affected men of a lower social status or who didn't feel, who didn't fit that idealized version of manhood. And women three mentions. It's only been since some of the men have said, me too, I'm suffering, I'm hurting, that it's really been taken seriously because women are women and women are soft and kind and weak. And it's been when the men's men the big burly men break down and cry and say, I'm suffering, then it's a big deal. So to wrap it all up, I know I presented a lot of results, but what did we find? So overall, women reported elevated symptoms for PTSD and anxiety relative to men, even when we took into account some risk factors. Women also reported higher levels of general social support. And during the interviews, women identified as more than just police officers. So they described their identities in relation to their networks outside of policing and may receive more support from individuals in these relationships when dealing with the challenges that they experience through policing. Women also reported uh, lower levels of organizational support than men police officers. And we saw in the interviews that women often, often reported having positive and rewarding careers but also indicating um, having really complex feelings toward their organization due to some experiences of discrimination and sexual harassment. Women's occupational challenges also included concerns and barriers to career advancements as a result of being mothers. So women often reported that stigma regarding mental health concerns was different if you were a man or if you were a woman, specifically, emotionality was deemed a feminine characteristic. And so women often felt dismissed when uh, they expressed their concerns or felt pressured to repress their emotions to conform. Les hommes ont rapporté des symptômes plus élevés de troubles de l'utilisation de l'alcool que les femmes. Les hommes ont également rapporté un soutien social général plus faible que les femmes, mais un soutien social organisationnel plus élevé. Les hommes ont discuté plus fréquemment que les femmes du principe de « nous » contre « eux » qui faisait partie de la culture policière. Donc, les hommes peuvent subir une pression pour appartenir au groupe de « nous » d'agents de police, ce qui pourrait entraîner à de plus grands rassemblements sociaux avec des collègues qui impliquent boire de l'alcool et potentiellement limiter les possibilités de soutien social de la part du groupe du « eux ». Donc, par exemple, tant que ce soit à l'extérieur de la police, donc leur famille, amis ou des femmes qui ne font pas partie du groupe de nous, d'hommes policiers. La culture policière peut aussi créer un environnement de travail particulièrement difficile pour les hommes qui ont un statut social inférieur en raison de l'idéal de masculinité hégémonique qui est présent dans la police et qui pourrait ensuite augmenter leur expérience d'isolement et de discrimination. Donc, il y a un nombre d'avenues pour l'avancement de la recherche en prenant en considération les résultats de cette étude. Premièrement, les questionnaires administrés par des cliniciens pourraient permettre de renforcer les résultats qu'on a vus ici. Aussi, une étude longitudinale à travers le temps pourrait nous montrer la, temp la temporalité des symptômes de troubles de santé mentale et comment ça évolue à travers la carrière. Aussi, ça nous aiderait à savoir si les différences que j'ai mentionnées étaient là avant le début de la carrière ou durant la carrière. Ensuite, faire des entrevues avec un plus grand nombre de participants à travers le Canada pourrait nous aider à représenter plus de diversité de résultats et une plus grande population. So where do we go from here? Participants provided concrete solutions to help support a healthy and supportive work environment. So for example, participants mentioned things as, such as increased staffing, formal succession planning, and having an on-site daycare. And hopefully those are things we can um, take into account in the conversation later on. Participating officers um, of both gendered also mentioned the importance of mental health training and education, such as providing helpful coping strategies that are really tailored to a police officer's experience. They also mentioned that they would like to extend this training to their family members and loved ones because they often experience the challenges of policing right alongside the members. 
And while police officers did not specifically offer recommendations in terms of the sexism and discrimination that women experience, there was an apparent need for supportive and preventative measures. So while men appeared to be aware that there were some gender-based challenges for their women counterparts in regards to work-life balance and interactions with the public, they did not appear to grasp that women also experience sexual harassment and gender-based discrimination from their organization. So women themselves were men mont uh, mentored as early as during police college on what it was to be a woman in policing. So it appears important to actively teach uh, both men and women about the gendered challenges women experience as to not place the burden solely on women's shoulder to cope with discrimination, instead by engaging men and women to create an environment that will foster safety and parity for all officers. So thank you so much for your time and I'll open it up to um, the panel discussion. But, uh, I want to thank you for that wonderful presentation, Andrea, and I'm going to welcome Lucy and we have Vaughn uh, who has gotten her video working for us, which is great. Uh, if you want to go ahead and join us, we certainly can do that. I'm just going to switch it uh, away from the presentation. Mickey, I know you're still with us on the phone, which is great. Uh, yeah. by voice only, I should say. Uh, so uh, again, thank you for that wonderful presentation. And uh, we are going to start with a bit of a, a discussion here. Uh, I am going to ask, um, I'll start with you, Mickey, uh, as someone who has uh, been a police officer and who is now in uh, police governance. Uh, do your experiences match uh, what Andrian has been talking about today? They certainly do, um, rather eerily so, as a matter of fact. Um, just to give some context, yes, I was a police officer, uh, oh, I joined in the, in the early 80s, so um, my experience in joining was a little bit different, but I'm sad to say some things just never change. Um, so from my perspective, I have that experience, then I left the police service, obviously for quite a while, joined corporate and was in human resources. And then I came back from a police governance standpoint. So I'm looking at it um, from the other side, if you, if you will. So uh, how I view some of this is uh, perhaps from a little bit of a different vantage point. But um, yes, your, your research doesn't surprise me. Um, in many ways, it saddens me. <laughs> um, I'd like to think that some things have changed. And I do have to say that even back in the 80s when I joined, that's not to say that all officers were not supportive. There were some wonderfully supportive officers, um, some who were incredibly professional and, and welcome women. Unfortunately, that was not the norm. And even they took some, um, well, they, it wasn't always an easy goal for them to uh, step to the plate and uh, support women on the service either. So uh, I can talk more, but I'll let the rest of the panel come from where they are and we can go from there. For sure. Thank you, Mickey. Uh, Lucy, do you want to share if your experiences match this, this study? Absolutely. Generally speaking, from uh, my experience, I joined the... Um, now the Canadian Armed Forces uh, and Military Police uh, occupation in 1988. So I also have experience from the 80s, 90s, and uh, and after that. So um, two combined occupations, but very well alike. Uh, the environment, um, you know, policies, um, you know, the type of work we do, um, operational experience, deployments, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, from both a, you know, whether it's a selection processes, it's, um, you know, promotion pro processes, as well as operation, all decisions, you know, where are we gonna be able to, to work, uh, what's available to us, what is not. When I joined, uh, not a lot of military occupations were close to women at the time, and they were just experiencing. So I think from what I hear of, uh, of the study that's very interesting is um, is a sense that, uh, you know, in, in 
certain terms, whether it's uh, harassment, sexual harassment or other things, uh, it starts somewhere and, you know, we're allowing certain behaviors to, to continue and to get worse and worse. And I read somewhere in Andrian's notes um, about the coping mechanism. So, so we build this, this shield, um, you know, whether we realize it or not. And, you know, some of us have natural resilience. Uh, uh, in other cases, it's learned and, and built from, uh, you know, who we are and what we do. But we don't realize it. And we're developing these coping uh, strategies to be able to to deal with all these issues. So I certainly have um, many examples and both uh, deployed operations where, you know, oh, well, you, you can't, you know, you're going to have a very difficult time to do your job because, you know, in Afghanistan, for example, they won't speak or deal or negotiate with the women. So uh, if there was more time, uh, I'd share that because it's very interesting and surprising outcomes that surprise many, many men out there. But um, it's, and I agree with what Mickey was saying about, um, um, you know, a lot of, um, it, it's it's not, we, we can't paint everyone, you know, the same way. There's a lot of people out there that have been very uh, proactive and um, have always uh, believed in, you know, equality, inclusiveness, and have never made the difference between uh, gender. Uh, you know, we know to recognize those people. Others had to work at it a bit more, but that's fine. That that's fine too. Uh, you know, to to uh, being able to get to where we are today. You know, it's really important. And yes, there is more progress to do, but um, you know, we've uh, I, I think we've gone a long way for, for sure. Um, so obviously, uh, Andrian's work is is very interesting, and it's probably not the only work in this area. Uh, that shows similar results. Uh, so Vaughn, starting with you, um, why don't we take a moment to start talking about what we think the solutions are to this gender uh, disparity. So Vaughn, if you wanna go ahead and start talking about some of the solutions you've been looking at as part of the RCMP. Sure, thanks. Um, well, I'll just to give a, a tiny bit of background on myself, I'm uh, obviously a civilian member of the RCMP and have been with the RCMP about three and a half years, but have worked on issues of gender and policing for probably over a decade, something I kind of fell into, and then you start working on it. And, and you know, because there's so much going on in this space, um, I kind of developed an interest in some expertise, but my background is in gender-based analysis plus. So intersectional and intersectional approach, GBA plus is sort of the government of Canada branding of that. But it's really a an analytical competency that we want to develop among public servants and people who are policy developers in terms of being able to look at the differential impacts of policies that we have or um, programs that we have. And I think in a law enforcement context and having worked a little bit with the military as well on similar issues, it's also about looking at our practices. So the way our cultures are really, they're not necessarily our policies, they're not necessarily our programs, but they're the way we do things and the things that are normalized as how we do things around here. And I think that this tool, this sort of analytical approach is actually very um, useful for looking at those types of things to start asking questions about, um, you know, how is the way that we go about things here or make decisions here, even if they're not written into our policies, how do they impact people differently? And I think the other thing that I bring with me into my job is um, while I do see the unique aspects of policing as a paramilitary hierarchical, you know, masculine hegemonic, as you said earlier, institutions, it's not the only um, sector in which there's occupational segregation. I think a great comparator group is the STEM field, so science, technology, engineering field, where when I had the opportunity to work with women in that sector, you know, at the space agency and other places, they reported so many of the same barriers. They might manifest a little bit differently, but sort of shockingly the same. And so to get to my point, I think this is a problem that's been well diagnosed. We know some of the issues, but they aren't always what we think they are. And I think that using an analytical rigor can help us to pinpoint them. 
So in my organization, when I came in and started talking about gender issues, obviously at the RCMP, there's a particular context around the publicity around harassment and things like that. Um, but there's also in tactical environments, this idea that, well, we already know the solutions. We just need to be action oriented and do this and that. So I think the approach that I brought with GBA plus was let's have a conversation that's let's stop. So when we're asking a question like, why don't we have any women in our um, emergency response teams or in some of our specialized units? You know, everyone has a quick answer of why they think that is. But we have actual research on that about occupational segregation that can give us better clues. And once we started to unpack it, you, know, you do start to have different solutions. And I think in our organization, GBA Plus has been a tool to first you stop and challenge your assumptions. You know, what am I assuming here based on my own experience and the people that I know um, about why there are no women in on ERT teams? And what do we actually know based on evidence about what keeps any sector not diverse? And to see, is there a match? If we're responding only to what we think rather than what we know, we're not gonna be effective. So it's been a, a very good tool because it's really just a way of getting people to think about the issues a little bit differently and maybe have difficult conversations in a more measured way, a less emotional way. Um, and I think it's been helpful, certainly for our senior executive at the RCMP, to start thinking about things as a matter of course, of when we're making a decision about anything right now, we're thinking, okay, what are we assuming about how everyone might experience this? Who are the people we have never talked to about this? Who might we need to hear? Is the people around our table diverse enough to even have that conversation? So I think in starting to build the solutions, Part of it is about establishing those baseline competencies about how we think about issues and also bringing in that comparative approach to stop thinking that you know policing is so special and unique and there are aspects of it that absolutely are but the barriers really the, those barriers those threads underneath are actually very much the same across different sectors uh mickey why don't you go ahead and talk about what you think some of the solutions to this issue are? Well, a lot of the, the solutions are, of course, uh, complicated. If they weren't complicated, we would have done them before now. Um, and a lot of it is just looking at diversity itself and why you have women. When I came on, um, there was a quota system, but it's not the quota system you think. It was actually a quota system to limit the number of women, not to get more women, because it was seen as a safety factor. Um, if we have too many women, the men won't be safe, because of course, you know that a woman can't back up a man in a bar fight, mm -hmm. which is the one they always trot out, even though, interestingly, there was no bars in our in our jurisdiction where I policed. But um, so it goes back to some very, very basic thinking, and it's not just the police. It is also um, the general population and how they see police and how they see policing. When we brought up the fact that there was still a gender issue in terms of numbers and promotion on the Edmonton Police Service, and, and they have made some uh, recent progress, mind you, but at the time we brought it up, we actually got some hate mail from some public that said, how dare we, um, women don't belong in policing. And so that's still going on. So um, one of the things that we have to do is dial it way back and talk about the value of diversity because where some people most people see a weakness they fail to see the strength and the strength is uh, what gives some women and you discovered this in your in your research uh, some of their angst they see things differently they approach things differently they they look for different solutions that's all a strength. And if we start to talk about that, and not all police officers have to be the same and have to react the same, then we can start to get some traction. 
and in its broad diversity too because you see that in different ethnic groups they also you know walking into a situation um, can see things differently and bring a, a different narrative to to what's happening that's a strength and so we have to talk um, differently, you have to have a different conversation about the whole issue. It's not men against women. It's not right or wrong. It's bringing different strengths to the organization and being able to use them in different ways. And the police are not very good at using um, human resources in different ways. They tend to hire one size fits all, train one size fits all, put you into the police service one size fits all. You all go through the same channel in exactly the same way. That's not exactly using diversity to its strength. So those are my comments. I'll let you have the last comment on what you think are some of the solutions for this issue. Sorry, we didn't hear the name, Emily, so... Uh... <laughs> Lucy, I am going to oh, let you... Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. I was trying to think. <laughs> it might be my time. <laughs> All right, so... Um, yes, as, um, you know, if we if we step back, I, I think at, uh, you know, what, what can be done, what are some of the solutions? I think we need to look at, the, you know, the fundamentals. So as, you know, uh, men and women in the policing industry, you know, we need to believe uh, that this is where we need to be and we need uh, equality, inclusiveness and, and uh, you know, um, and, and to get there. So so we are change agents. And if we believe uh, that we are and we can influence regardless of, uh, you know, the, the, the job that we have at the time, uh, I think I think that's fundamental. Um, and uh, there'll be always people that will resist to all kinds of things or policy change or that. But uh, I think that's a that's a great place to start. Uh, Andrean spoke of uh, culture, and uh, we know changing culture is not easy. Uh, at VIA, when I joined um, after my 28 years in the military and, and joining something completely different that was more business-like, uh, there was a huge, a great safety culture, but we needed to to, to instill a security culture and you know this works the same way uh, if the culture is not does not allow for positive change it's going to be an issue so um, traditionally I, I think it all starts at uh, you know uh, your strategic plan and, and the, the company or the, the the services values so traditionally in military policing we see a lot of common values such as you know honor service courage these types of things so we need to innovate and have organizational values that are more reflective of where we want to go um i i you know at via we had just a few years back exactly the same type of of uh, values you know service uh, uh, courage this type of, uh, of thing uh, now we have different values and one of them that I like and I, I think it's relevant here is uh, together we go further. So, I, you know, it opens to the fact that, you know, if, if we um, if we allow for the, the, you know, our culture and our values, this is where everything starts. And after that, you can start looking at the, at policies, uh, whether it's uh, recruiting uh, retention and then all of the internal HR fabric where you have you know positive and policies responsive to change um, you know the from selection processes you know uh, succession planning you know we heard some of that in uh, Andrean's report and I, th I think um, you know so, so anything from who's going to be on those panels you know is our panel you know, inclusive, do the people have the right tools, the right training, and do did we choose the right people? You know, and that, that's where it all starts to, to allow, be, you know, for, for to make positive change because, you know, paperwork alone, policies, procedures, and processes is, is not going to, uh, to fix this uh, by itself. So, um, you know, I think, I think it starts, you know, what we believe, um, you know, how 
how do we feel regardless of where we are we can be influencers in, in some ways uh, we don't you know we, we we're grateful to have experts you know many services uh, you know have re specialized resources uh, that are embedded to uh, develop a new model um, you know HR modernization and all that this is uh, fantastic and hopefully some of the smaller services smaller areas can rely on um, um, on on the organizations that have experienced success in that area so look at where the you know the the, the ratio men women in, in, in various services and in, in areas um, so who's successful and why are they successful and, and try to to share and that's what we do at the CCP, whether it's uh, HR and learning committee, uh, EDI, and more and more we're collaborating to work on different things together, remove silos, and uh, you know, and build products and tools and resources that the CCP membership, um, and in return, all of your services out there can can gain access to. So, what's being done out there that's successful? and that we can replicate you know across the board and change that culture uh, Adrian, i do have a question from the audience and i will direct it to you because you're the one that did the hard work on the research uh, avon may also be able to comment on this as well um is the symptom elevation that you're seeing in women so the higher reports is it similar compared to the general population with women experiencing higher rates than men yeah, so that's an interesting question. Um, we do see that there is, so women police officers might report elevated, even in the general um, public. However, there is a difference in the general public in um, this mental disorder prevalence as well. So that's important to take into account. Men and women in the general population, we do see that there are distinctions um, in how they uh, report mental disorder symptoms. And so um, it's, it might be something that might be interesting to take into account, but we do uh, see that there's higher rates of symptoms as well in uh, the policing population. Right, so um, we're, we are just wrapping up here. I do have one more question that I'm gonna ask uh, for our panelists. And I will uh, just ask you to um, give a, a minute or so answer to this. Um, what would your recommendations be uh, for a woman who may be in administration or, or in policing, that's the only woman in the room, uh, or they're a very clear minority at the table, what's the what's the thing that they could do to help affect change in their organization? And uh, Mickey, I'll go ahead and I'll start with you on that one. Because I have been the only woman in the room. <laughs> um, and I wish somebody give me this advice, be yourself. Uh, don't try to be one of the guys. Um, there's, you don't have to fit in. You will find your own path to, to do what's right, to voice your opinions. And it, yeah, it's okay to be different. And it's okay to see things differently and voice things in a different way. Um, so just go forward with it. And if they give you grief, keep on going. Best advice I can give. <laughs> Great advice. Uh, Vaughn, what would you, your thoughts be on this? Yeah, interesting. I think of it from a little bit of a different perspective coming from a civilian side, but I'm, you know, I've certainly frequently been the only civilian in the room. Um, certainly when I was working with the military, I would walk into a, you know, they were consulting me on gender issues and I'd walk into a table of uniformed men and, and, and it can be very intimidating. I think that, um, you know, I do come from the outside of this world. And um, so many people asked me when I joined the RCMP and, and I had spent so much of my career at Status of Women Canada where the gender balance was totally the other way. Um, you know, what's it like now that you're here and how do you find it? I think I found it was what I expected. And I think that that's been helpful to me that um, I think it's always good to keep an honest perspective about what it is that you're going through. Um, I think that there can be a lot of pressure to take a lot on and I think feeling like 
No, you don't have to every day, right? Like not every day can you be the big strong voice that's going to um, call everybody to account or make everybody accountable. Um, I think what's been helpful for me is really trying to do what I could to demonstrate my value to the group and keeping maintaining that confidence in my own value. You know, I may not be a, a cop, um, I'm married to one, I don't, you know, that helps a little bit in terms of understanding the reality. But um, I think maintaining my belief that I had something to contribute that may not be, you know, they may not, I would always, I always think they don't see it now, <laughs> but they will. And, um, and I think sort of keeping a, an even keel, not feeling like you have to take on everything for everyone all the time, but, you know, maintaining that belief that, you know, I do have, I do have something to offer here that's a little bit different. And uh, I think that's, that's probably my advice. Oh. I, I'm gonna go ahead just because I missed um, what was said. Uh, yeah, this is fantastic. I still, it still does happen to me uh, to, to be in a room and, and uh, you know, uh, sometimes I wonder if I even notice it anymore. Um, you know, I, I have to agree with some of what I heard is, um, you know, is, no, just being yourself, you're at that table for a reason, and, and that's why um, you're there, I guess. Uh, I, you know, uh, I, from experience, I, I, I know that oftentimes, uh, you know, you see people in uniforms, certain status, certain rank, or age group, and, you know, that can be very intimidating, and now I'm, you know, uh, it, it's more from the uh, speaking of my experience in the 80s and 90s um, but what i found with time and especially now that you know society is uh, is evolving is you know when someone uh, said that you never be able to work with a certain person or a certain position because of you know uh, you're female not a male and it's just not accepted in certain cultures and what i found is um you know sometimes it's just a matter of touching that human cord, like the, the you know, everyone has a human side. And sometimes uh, it's just a matter of speaking of something unrelated to work, to realize that uh, in the end we're all equal and we're there to do a job and, you know, they, they'll get to respect, you know, um, the, the, the role you're in and what you do. And sometimes they realize that, you know, you had perceptions of, of um, what they think of you but it, it, it's a false perception so um so thankfully it, it happens less and less uh, as i said before you know we've developed obviously some coping mechanisms and unfortunately for uh, certain people the anxiety and the stress uh, that harassment or um you know stigma and, and these things have built up to a level where they uh, are experiencing mental health uh, problems and that's very unfortunate in other cases uh, you know it doesn't mean uh, we didn't feel and live the anxiety but uh, at some point we were able to cope with it so um, again it all falls back to believing that you know you're there for uh, a reason and, and and more and more it's just going to be transparent uh, and in inclusiveness we know you know that our topic today is men and women in policing, but you know, inclusiveness goes way, way further. And I think as we, you know, evolve in, in both fronts, um, you know, uh, pushing, you know, gender parity and gender equality and inclusiveness, um, you know, we're gonna accelerate the progress, you know, much, much faster and, and, and remove all those barriers. Thank you very much uh, to everybody here today, uh, to Andrea for her wonderful presentation and for our panelists for being part of it. Uh, you really are taking research and making it have an impact. I also want to pass on Dr. Carlton's emphatic thank yous to everybody today for this wonderful presentation. Um, just a quick reminder, there will be a little survey when you, that'll appear after the town hall is finished. We ask that you fill those a uh, couple of questions out for us just so we can get some feedback from you. A video of the town hall that you watched today will be sent out to your email, and uh, we hope that you will share that with other people who weren't able to attend today. 
We also like to let you know that our next webinar is going to be on November the 26th. We'll be continuing the post-traumatic stress injury series and talking about three new innovative projects. If you haven't signed up already, uh, the link is available on our website and it'll be in the follow-up email. Again, thank you for being here today. Please take care and stay safe.